Hi, everybody, and welcome to Big Joe's Journal. Uh, once again, with the uh, pandemic and everything, we're wearing the old mask here. And uh, what a beautiful day we have. Spring just rolled in, and uh, it's like winter, you know, made one last big effort last week, bowed out, and now we've got some beautiful weather, sunshiny weather. We're very, very fortunate in this part of the country. You know, other parts of the country are, are not so lucky. For example, down in the, uh, well, up through the Mississippi Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley in the southeast, they're battling hurricanes and tornadoes and all kinds of uh, inclement weather. And uh, here we are up in the northeast, which usually takes a really hard hit in the wintertime. We've got beautiful weather. The same can't be said for the folks out in the Rocky Mountain area. Denver getting hit with uh, another momentous snowfall up through Iowa and uh, going right up uh, the Mississippi Valley, right into Montana and the Dakotas and everything else. You're still feeling the effects of winter. But fortunately, uh, the good Lord must like this part of the woods for some reason or another. And we're getting those warm breezes that are coming in from the south now, which is quite a switch from what we had a week ago. When uh, I look back one week ago, that Monday it was cold, really cold. And here we are a week later, and man, it's a preview of, uh, of spring and a preview of summer. and Things are, things are looking up. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe we're getting there. For sports fans, well, you got a lot going for you right now. You got the NCAA tournament, the NIT tournament, uh, the NCAA both for men and women, and uh, the NIT for teams that uh, didn't quite qualify for the NCAA. And on the other hand, spring training, baseball is back with a number of changes. And the big league season gets underway next week. So this will be their last week of spring training. And those of you who are Red Sox fans, we kind of wonder what kind of a team we're going to have this year. After the disaster of a year ago, there are a lot of new faces on the Red Sox. And uh, Alex Cora, after a year's suspension for being a bad boy and cheating, is back at the helm of the Sox, and he's brought a lot of um, Latin American players with him that are going to help the team. So the big thing for the Red Sox, of course, is pitching. They still are going to have problems with their pitching staff. I know uh, watching some of these spring training games, they were using some of the guys that they had last year, which was a was a total disaster. And uh, they brought in a, a couple of new arms this year, and we will see what happens. In the meantime, you have the Yankees that are in training, but they're very high payroll, the defending world champ Dodgers. And uh, next week, they start playing for keeps, and we'll see where we go from there. And the national situation, we have a big problem, of course, on our, our southern border. Thousands of people are walking hundreds of miles to get to the United States. It's like the election of, of Joe Biden, and that is what a number of them that are interviewed, this is what they say. With a new president, with Joe Biden, they have hope. They want to get out of their countries where they live in fear, where there's dictatorship where there's uh, gang wars, where drug cartels are pretty well roaming at will, killing whoever gets in their way. These people are looking for a new chance in life. In many, many cases, parents that can't make the trip themselves, they send their children. And of course, we are our border patrol and uh, we're just overloaded with kids that have come up from Central America up through Mexico, some of them crossed the border illegally. And the Republicans are saying, well, now, if we still had Trump in there, he'd close, you know, it wouldn't, well, 
you have to show compassion. And these people are looking at the United States, they're looking at the fact that we dumped a would-be dictator, we brought in a administration that has a reputation for humanity, for care, and people that got a brain in their head, they want a part of that. Unfortunately, there are still people in this country, including in our government, that are saying, well, if Trump were still there, and this, so forth and so on. Well, we do have a problem on our border, but it's not one that we can't handle, and that will be handled. It's going to take a little bit of a while to get, get a handle on it, but it will be worked out. And we certainly uh, welcome new citizens into this country. They come with new ideas, fresh ideas, fresh determination. They aren't coming up here to get the uh, social benefits and all that. They come up here to earn a living. They have a decent uh, life, decent home life. And so this, this situation will be resolved. The big thing, of course, that is going to shape us for years to come, and that is the COVID-19, the coronavirus. We seem to get it under control in one area, and it spikes up in another. Right now, with many of these colleges on spring break and heading to Florida, uh, Miami Beach is in the news right now, where the mayor of Miami Beach has closed off some of the access to the city. People can leave. But it's another thing to try to get in. And he's put in a curfew. And um, these spring break folks that are down there, not only, not only college students, most of them are college students, but also some uh, older people that have uh, taken a break and gone to Florida to enjoy that wonderful sunshine and the heat and everything else that goes with it. And the result is that uh, Miami Beach has been plagued with an increase in the number of uh, infections with the COVID-19, there are still some people that refuse to wear a mask. There are some that still refuse to be inoculated to get the vaccine. I've had, uh, as a senior citizen or a senior senior citizen, I've had my two uh, COVID-19 shots and still hanging around, still going day by day. But very, very, very necessary, you know, as it goes down to the younger people, you have an opportunity to get your shots, get it and be safe. And let's get this thing under control. We talk about going back to normal. Uh, that'll be sometime down the road is we've got to look at the way we're doing things and we've got to make changes. And some changes may be a little difficult to accept, but they have to be made if we're gonna, gonna survive. An example, the upcoming baseball season, you know, how this is gonna be handled. It's only gonna be a limited number of people allowed in the ballpark. Much of the play-by-play -play announcing is going to be done remote from the studio. People that are watching it on TV, the same as we are. And they will do their commentary on the game in progress. But there will be very, very limited seating capacity in all ballparks. And that is probably the way it will be throughout the season. Now, will they get in a full season? I don't know. But there are changes that have to be made and that will be made. And one of the things that we're gonna to have to change is our school system. You look at this year and you look at the number of, of students that uh, they're in school part of the time, other times they're watching it on, on computers and on Zoom and everything else. But it's very, very tough to get the type of education that these kids need. There's no substitute for a relationship, a personal relationship, between the teacher and the student, that face-to-face -face business.
back and forth relationship. We also find that students are safer when they're outside, not locked in the classroom. So there are a number of things that we can look at, a number of them people won't agree with. One is to take this year, because the kids that are going to graduate this year, their diploma will be virtually worthless. They won't have had the depth in the teaching and the opportunity to explore. The idea of a good teacher is that you interest your student in that subject and you get them to want to develop their knowledge in that particular area. And you are there to help them, to coach them, to advise them. But the bulk of the work has to be done by them. And to do that, they've got to have the foundations laid down. They've got to have the encouragement. And uh, a lot of our people, of course, are bored with this quarantine. It gets to everybody. You know, I'm, I'm sort of like a hermit. It's just myself and my 14-year-old uh, dog. But after a while, you kind of wonder, you know, you want human contact. Go out and meet other people. Talk with somebody. So we've got to take a look at how we do education. Now, one way, and it would probably be totally unacceptable, that's to hold everybody up for a year. Say, this year's lost, we're going to repeat it next year. Well, that probably would not be very acceptable. People say, well, you're taking a year out of my child's life. Yes, we are, under that scope. And, you know, I think what we've got to do, we've got to start off by coming up with some achievement tests and see where our students stand, what level of education they're at. Now, if everybody were held up a year, that would create a rather large influx when you get down into the first grade kindergarten, pre-kindergarten area. Well, more, more like kindergarten and first grade if students are going to be asked to repeat those grades. That is one way of doing it, and probably totally unacceptable. The other way is to flip-flop the school year. More and more classes are going to have to take place not in the classroom, but outside. And winter is not the best time to be outside when the temperature is there very, very cold and very, very frigid. The time to be outside is in spring, in summer, in early fall. And the way you teach is going to have to change a little bit. You might have, say, two days a week in the classroom, three days out in the field, or three and two, whichever way they want to do it. But if we're going to get this thing under control, we've got to make these changes. So I think what we're going to have to do is begin the school year in March. Now, a number of people are reopening their schools and are, are ready to roll here in April. They go April, May, then they're out in June. That's not a school year. Kids aren't going to learn that much in that short time. You're going to have to pull together what they've had earlier in the year. It's, you know, it's trying to make hash. Let's say corned beef hash for supper and warm it up. To get in a full school academic year, a year with meaning, a year with development, and all that. You're going to have to begin the school year in March. Let's say late March, such as it is now. After the, 50, after the Ides of March. Use that as a key. Go from there. Wrap it up around Thanksgiving. 
the end of November, first part of December. And go through the summer. There are holidays that they would have off. Memorial Day, maybe around July 4th, have a week's vacation. Labor Day week, have another week's vacation. Then wrap up the school year. The uh, big sport, if you're looking at it that way, would be your baseball, softball, and lacrosse, and possibly football would uh, would close out the school year instead of being the start of the school year. But the point is that they would have a full year. It'd be the teacher to student contact, and they would have this opportunity to get back on track. Well, you say, well, what can you do if you're going to be outside the classroom? Well, you know, as a teacher, sometimes you're in the classrooms, the kids are they're tired or they're bored, and they're, they're not even hearing. They're not listening to you. you. Call on somebody and say, what do you think of this, or so forth. And they haven't the foggiest notion of what you're talking about. But if you have, where well, you're going to do a couple of days in the classroom or three days in the classroom, then you're going to be out in the field. I think they're going to find it a lot more interesting, especially if you're teaching science. Tremendous opportunity for science around here. You know, you've got, you've got the, uh, um, I haven't seen you more, but the, the Pine Area Park, which would be a great learning experience for kids that are studying science. You've got Otter Creek. You go up on the mountain, you've got your state parks. State parks would be a wonderful, wonderful area to educate your kids on the different things, the different types of trees, the different types of animals, insects, what makes up Mother Nature. And our lakes. Take advantage of them, as summer camps do, and things you can learn from there. Different approach, but the learning is taking place. Well, you say, how about social studies? Say English. Let's take English. Well, you have two or three days in the classroom. You go outside, teach English outside in the sunshine. They get a lot more out of it. And you can also take field trips. For example, going up to, to uh, the Robert Frost homestead that's maintained by Middlebury College up above the snow bowl there in Faceton. It'd be a field trip. Other field trips? For the Lake Champlain, maybe book a tour on, uh, on the Carillone which is a little tour boat where they take tourists up and down the lake. It'd be great for social studies, especially for history. You're studying history. Take a cruise on the lake, go up around by uh, Grand Isle, Isle La Motte, the first French fort built in Vermont. You're coming down the lake. Um, well, the various battle sites that took place there in the War of 1812. Uh, area in Ferrisburg, where Benedict Arnold used to build some of his boats, small boats, that he used to slow down John Burgoyne's trip down Lake Champlain on his way to Saratoga. You can also go by Mount Independence, Fort Ticonderoga. All kinds of opportunities that you take advantage of. And also, again, they visit the Fort Ty. They visit the Mount Independence. They visit the Hubbard and Battlefield. They visit to the Bennington Monument. To the National Cemetery in Saratoga, where many of those that were died at the Battle of Saratoga lie buried. In Hubbardton, where a number of the Hessian troops 
lie buried that fought in that battle. Also visit uh, to the Calvin Coolidge homestead. And there are a number of other areas we can, we can visit. One that I was always interested in, and I was totally unaware of it until a few years back when I was teaching dry bread in Bellis Falls, There's a schoolhouse in, uh, in uh, Dummerston. It's located out in West Dummerston. And it was made of brick, and it's a, a circular building. And it has four windows each direction. The classroom was up on the second floor. The ground floor was where the teacher kept a couple of horses. Now, What's the importance of that? His name was John Robinson. And John Robinson, for whatever reason, had been condemned to hang in England, and he escaped. And he made his way over here to the United States. And uh, after one thing or another, he managed to settle in, in the wilds of Vermont. And he passed himself off as a teacher. Actually, he was a highwayman. In other words, holding up stagecoaches and all that. But he located in Vermont because there's no extradition in those days. And he had two lucrative stagecoach routes. One came up from Boston, up through New Hampshire, Walpole, and Bellis Falls, up through that area. The other followed what we call the Mohawk Trail. Route 2 in Massachusetts, cutting across the northern section of Massachusetts, just below the state line with Vermont. So he'd go down, he could uh, do a heist on a stagecoach, skate back into Vermont. Well, he wanted some legitimacy, so he built that schoolhouse. And he always kept two horses on the ground floor, kept him saddled. And he had, there's like a fireman's pole that he could slide down. The other people to get up there, of course, there was a stairway, naturally. But there's also that fireman's pole, what we call a fireman's pole, where he could hop on and slide down, hit the horse, and be gone. And the reason they had where the windows were, he wanted to be able to see if anybody was coming. Well, they said extradition laws were not, uh, did not exist in those days. But that didn't stop, say, a posse from Massachusetts coming up into Vermont to try and get them. One particular occasion, he held up stagecoach around Walpole, New Hampshire. And of course, he escaped back into Vermont. And the folks in New Hampshire were fed up with it. So they said, well, we're going to take care of it ourselves. They won't do it in Vermont. We'll take care of it ourselves. So they organized the vigilante group. And the bridge was uh, it's now known as the uh, Vitus Bridge. It goes uh, from Walpole into Bellis Falls. It's not the, uh, the big large bridge that goes over North Walpole. It's the one on the southern end. And they started organizing in Walpole, and they were going to march into Vermont, and they were going to take matters into their own hands. Well, on the Vermont side, word got to it that uh, a bunch of vigilantes from New Hampshire were moving into Vermont. Well, the Vermonters weren't going to have any of that. They didn't want any New Hampshireites over here uh, taking the law into their own hands. So a group of citizens organized down there. And uh, as the New Hampshire folks came and came on the bridge, they were met by a large array of well-armed Vermont farmers. They said, you're not coming in our state and taking anybody out of here. And there was a standoff. And eventually, cooler heads prevailed. And the New Hampshire folks went back home, the Vermont folks back home, and John Robinson, Another successful robbery. But the time came when a group from Massachusetts 
led by a sheriff in one of the counties down there, came into Vermont, bound and determined to nail them. And he saw them coming, so he hit the fireman's pole, horse saw ready to go, and took off. And that's the last anybody ever saw of John Robinson. But that brick schoolhouse is still there. And it's still a historical monument in Vermont. Now, very, very few people know about that. But there's another opportunity for kids to learn about our state, how we've developed. And we've got to take a look at this, folks, because things aren't going to go back the way they were. They can't. It's too risky. We can't go through another year like this. Our kids are losing too much. They're falling too far behind. That's why I think we need to start off with achievement tests and say, well, let's, let's see where we are. Let's find out where we are. And take a look at this, and we go from there. I was talking with uh, Senator Cheryl Hooker the other day. I asked her if there's anything in the legislature. Has the legislature taken up anything like that? And she said, no, not yet. And they probably won't because they're going to be adjourning here probably another six weeks or so. But it's something we should look at, and we should not waste a lot of time on it. Because if we lose another year, you're two years behind. And the longer you wait, and the longer you put it off, the bigger the problem is going to be. And you know, it's like a, it's like a disease or like a sort of, if you don't deal with it right away and get it taken care of and set it up, it gets harder and harder the longer you wait. So, for what it's worth, an old retired teacher, maybe, now look at the situation. This is the way I think we got to go. Now, some people may not like the idea of teaching in the summertime, but you know, I, I taught driver ed for 30 years. And you got a lot more done in the summer, working with these kids and, and teaching them. They're, they're more relaxed, they're more, you know, uh, well, I don't know what it's, it was so much easier than during the regular school year. Because I think you could get a lot more get a much better response. Now, I know driver ed is different, but the idea is the same thing. You know, you deal with your students as, as individuals, and you try to bring out the best of them. Do the best you can. And for most of them it works, for a few it won't. But. The state has got to take a look at this. Say, well, I can do it on the national level. Well, you know, according to the Constitution, education is not the responsibility of the federal government. It's the responsibility of the individual states. And um, some states are going to do it well, and some states are not. So, Hopefully, things will resolve, and we will see what happens. In the meantime, got beautiful weather, going to have a very, very beautiful week. And if you haven't been able to get out much, uh, just go outside for a little while and enjoy the sunshine, and especially today, Monday and Tuesday. You know, better days are coming. And thank God spring is here, it's summer and fall, we don't want to think beyond that. But we're going to get a little reprieve. And I think eventually we're going to get some kind of control on this, this virus. People get shots, we'll get it under control at least temporarily, and then figure out where we go from there. So with that, as this hour grinds down, May Almighty God, His infinite wisdom, 
bless these United States of America, each and every one of you. And you all have a great week, and I'll see you all next week.